Bonjour à tous uh, et bienvenue. Uh, Hello to everyone and welcome on this fine Sunday morning uh, to the second edition of the documentary and audiovisual form. As you are probably aware, this should be have been the third one, but we all know what happened last year. And uh, this year, nothing has stopped us. Nothing has prevented us from holding the second edition. So here we are. We're very happy today to have all of these people with us, these very eminent filmmakers, to speak about distribution issues. But before saying anything more, let me quick give the floor to our new director of the industry, Madeleine Hobel, who will say a few words about how what will be happening this morning. So I wish you a very productive forum. Please don't hesitate to go watch films, professionals, oh, in following days, and then see films, watch films in the second part of the week as well, because we will be showing more films. I wish you a very pleasant Sunday. Hello, thank you very much. And welcome to the 2021 edition for the industry today. The documentary and audiovisual forum will be composed of three panel discussions and I will let our moderator Barbara Miller present uh, and introduce this. I would like to thank Barbara for having agreed to act as moderator. So the documentary and audiovisual forum is a joint effort between Vision du Réel and Focal and now I will let Peter Hagen take the floor and uh, say a few words about this uh, joint effort. So I would like to give you some technical information for those who participants were online. So there will be discussion in several languages because this is the Swiss branch of the industry. If you could. Okay, and it will be in English for all of those who are following us on the Vision du Réel website. You can activate the simultaneous interpretation in English, interpretation into English. Without further delay, I would like to give the floor to Peter Eigen from Focal, who will explain. We have translation into English, from German into English and from French into English. So when German is spoken, if you don't understand German, please listen to the translation. Yes, thank you very much indeed, Emily, Melinda Robert. We have been doing this cooperation now for three years. This cooperation between Focal and Vision du Réel. This event always concerns the future of documentary film. What kind of conditions does documentary film need in order to flourish? That is the constant theme which has been running through this event for several years. And uh, we hope that. Uh, we would like to thank the people who have worked uh, a lot in favor of the cooperation that has made this panel possible. And uh, I'm very glad that uh, we were able to hold the panel this year, even though we had to cancel it last year due to the circumstances that you are familiar with. We organized all of the panel she works with the industry and so without further delay i will give the floor to barbara miller president of the rff who will be moderating these three panels uh, all on the burning issue of uh, film distribution in all of their forms in cinemas on vod platforms and uh, we will be looking at the future prospects uh, the prospects for tomorrow Yes, thank you very much. Um, I, I would like to welcome all of those. Thank you. I'm pleased to be able to welcome everyone. As you said, the subject is the distribution of creative documentary films and the opportunities and dangers that this new uh, form brings with it. We are going to divide the panel discussion into three sections. First of all, innovations. 
that are necessary in order to promote uh, creative uh, documentary films. I have two guests with me. Second section concerns online distribution offers of uh, government agencies, for example, Swiss radio and television. And in the third section, we will be concerned of about, we'll be talking about the opportunities from the point of view of film distribution and cinema distribution. I would like to welcome Matthias Bircher, Head of Distribution and Diversity at the Swiss Federal Office of Culture. Susa Katz, the Deputy Managing Director responsible for the non-fiction department and distribution online from Vienna. We will have with us Barbara Frentzen, Director of Film Department, Arts, Culture, Civil Service and Sport at the Federal Ministry of Re Federal Ministry, Republic of Austria. And we will also have with us remotely Natalie Capio from Flanders Images at your images, gender and inclusion. I would like to start with Matthias Bircher and ask him what new forms of film distribution promotion have you introduced at the Federal Office of Culture? I would just like to express my thanks. This is the first time that I've seen so many people together. I would just like to say that I'm new at this because I just took over this department. And so uh, this is a steep learning curve for me. I'm learning all about this. That said, I was in the production division for five years and uh, we really saw the documentary film format uh, develop in Switzerland during this time, and uh, not just in festivals, but also in cinemas. So now it's normal that we're seeing so many documentary films. And also with regard to the financing of these uh, documentaries, we've gone from 13 million a year to 20 million a year in terms of funding. The and. Uh, also, with the Pixar site, uh, this uh, uh, now the number of films has increased sharply. We've gone from 35 to 55 documentary films, so, so we could have uh, one film per week in movie theaters. So that really, uh, we can see that in movie theaters, the, the documentary films account for five to ten percent every year. These are usually fragile movie theaters, the ones that show this. So before 2020, the environment was already a bit difficult for documentary films. So I can really see a problem here because we uh, are showing films that are really made for the big screen and aesthetics that are made for that. And uh, they have a very sophisticated sound and image and music and composition and so on. And these films are really made for the cinema. Now, if we see, if we look at the other platforms, what I see in platforms for the general public, you see these are either for special interest or these are historical documentary films. So I think that we have to find some kind of means to make these films more accessible for platforms that are tailored to the general public because these, as it stands, a lot of these documentary films are quite marginal. So as we see it, what we have done, and uh, we can see that up until now, in the production, on the production side, you have producers and you have the funding, and we know that the films produced are essentially funded in terms of distribution that there's a semi-private format we support things but we also work together we have verified every invoice and so on we have to have very strict accounting so we worked on this system because this is an uh, you, you you get as much money as what you bring in so this system doesn't work for everyone 
we have opened a selective window for films that couldn't work uh, using this format. Uh, but we then, of course, have to uh, give just provide justification of all of our expenditure. Now, with this type of experience, we supported three documentary films. And for the time being, it's a little hard to say in 2021 because we don't know exactly, distributors don't know what how many spectators will come and view films. So we, but the dis, film distributors don't wanna take any risks at present. And afterwards, these are films we took a very selective approach, and some of these films are perhaps a bit more fragile, so to speak. So um, we can see that, in fact, there is a potential general public, but these are people who see films, and the distributors really have to create these contacts and bring the people to the cinemas to view the films. We don't really know yet if that'll work. We'll have to, time will tell. After this first round, can you tell us something about your selection criteria? Were, did you want to have special forms of uh, uh, promotion? Uh, what were the criteria that you used? Okay, what we're really primarily interested in, in terms of selection criteria, because before we had some standard selection criteria that were, but we don't think that that's possible anymore for the documentary film format. So what's important for us is that the distributor has to find other means that they're also mindful of the potential. So we're seeing that uh, how this can work and how they can bring spectators in. But it's always a little bit difficult. We're not really sure if this method will work or not. We have films that we didn't support and then the community. Um, so sometimes films don't have enough backing and then it's, it's a little hard so sometimes things don't work and then there is aren't enough uh, viewers for documentary films so this is a real challenge for producers i must admit you have also introduced a new form of film distribution promotion recently. What uh, considerations did you have in mind at the time? And what uh, has been your experience up to now? Thank you for the invitation. Well, it's not really a new form of uh, film distribution promotion. It's just something that we support from A to B. Most of the uh, concentration of the funding is uh, concentrated on production. We have uh, observed the situation for years and in the last five years, we've uh, had a good discussion with the platform. What we're concerned with is visibility. We want to really focus on the films that are being promoted. The discussion already starts beforehand for whom and how. The ultimate objective is always for uh, uh, cinemas, but we've realized that cinemas uh, are not going to be the only forum. The incentives will not be provided just for cinema. We also have to consider other platforms. And there's also the secondary audience in film, which is often uh, forgotten. But um, of course, um, it's important to organize uh, events with uh, documentary films. It does not necessarily have to be in official cinemas. It has to be in a room where discussion can be held, can be held about the topic shown in the film. And uh, normally people don't have an incentive to talk about the subject of a film if they just go and see it in a cinema. And then afterwards they tend to forget 
So um, it's also important to consider the whole life of the film, how it was, how it came into being. This promotion was introduced uh, for marketing and uh, promotional measures. Film is teamwork. It starts right at the beginning when a person has the idea and right at the end uh, when the effect of the film has been achieved when you reach the evaluation stage. We've been testing an instrument for two or three years now. We want people to uh, sit down at an early stage. Um, the uh, producers and the film directors and the uh, distributors have to sit down and talk about the intended audience at an early stage. Sometimes it may just be a festival film. No one really forces uh, films to go into cinemas. It's um, distributors and cinemas that coordinate things. They know their audience. But how do they reach the audience? That's the question. And we have tried to get, uh, we've tried to motivate people to plan at an early stage. And uh, we have to give people financial incentives to plan at an early stage. We have to tell them how much uh, money we're going to give them. And we want to involve know-how as well. Because as far as um, uh, s film distributors and uh, film uh, cinema operators are concerned, they know that there are too many films on the market. At our film foundation, we try to do more with less. We uh, try to achieve more results with less, uh, uh, but um, although we're increasing incentives, at the same time, we have to guarantee that we ensure a lot of uh, diversity and we have to ensure that the opportunities are available for everyone. After two or three years, I cannot say very much because it takes a long time to evaluate films. We are noticing the following trend. Um, some uh, some films are uh, shown only at uh, festivals, and uh, so some people felt more self-assured when they, uh, after their film had been shown at a festival. But the production has uh, increased their resources uh, with regard to possible appearances at uh, festivals. But our um, PN, RPR uh, costs in Switzerland are always included in the initial budget. But if you have about 5% uh, or 3% of your funding, which is earmarked for producing uh, uh, posters or trailers, and uh, the uh, production budget budgets are very large, but then suddenly when the uh, film is ready, all the budget, people realize that all the budget has been used up and uh, not much money is left for PR. And in future, we want to try to avoid this by giving uh, injections. So we want to, at an early stage, we want to determine who we want to reach with this film and how. We still have automatic um, promotion for film distribution, but they only receive a lump sum. And then depending on the degree of success, the number of uh, screenings, the number of uh, spectators in Swiss uh, uh, cinemas, the calculation is done based on the costs. Then uh, there's a third track which we've developed. That is that production firms um, approach uh, authors without uh, forcing distributors to take their film. But there are more and more cinema owners, particularly small ones, who are determined to show uh, documentary films. Uh, they often have five or six screenings at which they have a full house. Uh, because the uh, film director is on the spot to have uh, discussions before or after the film. 
uh, or to screen films in museums, for example. So they take their own initiative to uh, offer lump, uh, some packages. This has been done for quite a few for a few films. It's a bit too early uh, to really evaluate the situation because uh, uh, we only, we've only had experience with about two or three films. Some films received conventional uh, film distribution uh, promotional funds, but they only had one or two thousand viewers. So many people have a classical uh, form of thinking. In other words, they work only with conventional distributors. Thank you, Barbara. What is the situation in Austria? In Austria, how do you manage to promote uh, documentary film? Good morning from uh, Vienna. We have some echo. First of all, let me say something about film promotion at the federal level. There are two institutions, the Austrian Film Institution, which gets 100% of its budget from, from the federal government, which does a number of uh, different types of uh, production, and it bases its work on the Film Promotion Act. Then there is film promotion measures uh, within the ministry, of which I'm in charge. And we also um, base our work on the film promotion law. We promote all forms of documentary films, which are contemporary uh, hybrid films, which include non-fiction, but uh, which sometimes uh, blur the borders between documentary film and fiction. Now, uh, now as regards the conditions, first of all, the launch has to take place in uh, a cinema, but the state is discussing this and has been for several years. For several years, people have been saying that this should be changed. But of course, there are the utilization uh, windows which are involved because, of course, television um, television can only uh, show the films once they have uh, finished their screenings in the cinema. In the last few years, we've started to introduce new forms. In other words, um, the regulation now says that they should not um, necessarily show the first screening in uh, cinemas because more and more emphasis is being placed on digital utilization. That's um, also important because then there is a very broad public, re regardless of uh, what the subsequent utilization is. In Austria, we have distributors that uh, try to reach out to very specific uh, target groups with special evenings, with uh, discussions with the audience which is uh, particularly important with documentary films. And then depending on the film and uh, depending on the cooperation with NGOs or whatever, the aim is to really reach the public uh, more uh, in a more targeted manner. This has proved its worth and uh, that is what our promotional uh, funding is uh, geared to. And uh, so, so if the films meet our criteria, we provide the funds. This has proved its worth up to now. And of course, digital uh, uh, watching of films has been accelerated as a result of the coronavirus uh, pandemic and uh, film producers uh, uh, targeting the target audience more, so that we are seeing more live streaming and uh, also event-based forms, and uh, this has proved to be successful because there is a very clear difference. 
Festivals oder in der sonst regulären Verwertung. Weil Between uh, use of documentary films in festivals or in normal use, it depends whether there is an, an event character or not. And then there's also the feeling of being together, which you get in a traditional uh, cinema audience because the shift between the public space in the cinema to the digital space and to the private sphere of one's home, this shift really does mean something. And, uh, and uh, of course, um, the uh, discussions that we have at festivals such as uh, Vision du Réel uh, uh, enable an, an exchange, a public exchange, but of course in times of uh, uh, the coronavirus pandemic, one can ask oneself the question about what the difference, is, uh, what kind of difference a festival makes. And um, the question is how can one recreate this festival character? Uh, by digital means, we have to try out new things, we have to try to come up with new ideas and uh, believe a lot of creative ideas have been released. Uh, filmmakers often seem to suffer when their films are not shown in cinemas at all. And of course, at the moment here in Austria, cinemas are closed. So it's difficult to show films in cinemas at the moment. So we're doing experiments. And this uh, discussion has been held at the uh, European level as to how strong the film distributors are. And uh, at the European level, these structures have to be strengthened in order to ensure more visibility uh, in uh, terms of digital competition. There are quite a lot of uh, small, fragile uh, films uh, which um, run the risk of disappearing uh, unless they can really reach their public in a specific market niche. And these are areas in which we are continuing to learn and which we are trying to support to these developments as well as possible. Moderator, I can uh, sense a great deal of openness on uh, all sides. Uh, Natalie Capio, how are things in Flanders with you? Um, in 2020, the, the fund decided to give an extra support uh, to documentary filmmakers. Um, and actually, it's happening on two levels. Um, because the Association of the Documentary Filmmakers they decided to, to um, set up to create an initiative it's called film pact and it's based on the activities and and the vision of uh, an organization like doc society that maybe you know um, which is really working on the impact that a social impact or political impact um, that a documentary film can have um, and so what they are trying is to um, have this organization uh, helping documentary makers uh, by uh, professional experts to find other ways to um, have an, to create another outreach, but also with the, the goal of uh, making impact. Um, they are doing this, um, they are organizing uh, workshops, they are also um, coaching and counseling uh, individual projects. Um, and so the, the fund decided actually to um, support this uh, initiative um, for three years, uh, from 2020 to 2022, uh, with a bonus of 45,000 euros. And for this, of course, we have a contract with all the, the, the activities that they have to um, uh, um, uh, organize and, and uh, complete so at, in the end they will also have to make a report an evalu evaluation report um, and also uh, there are a couple they have made a selection of um, documentary films that they will um, uh, coach and um, uh, counsel from the beginning until the end so this is also in the contract and then there's another bonus that we created um, it's called the outreach bonus 
which is for us uh, even more important be because we don't want to ask every producer or every documentary filmmaker to go as far as wanting to create an impact on a social or political level. But for us and for them also, the most important thing is to create a kind of alternative uh, distribution. Um, as my previous uh, um, panel speakers, uh, they also talked about this. It's um, a part or on top of the, the traditional um, uh, theater uh, releases or uh, streaming releases to find also um, other and wider audiences um, that can be more um, interested in going to see this film because of the theme, because they are um, concerned by topics that are talked about in the film. And so um, we give a bonus on, of 4,000 euro on top of the production support for long and mid-length uh, documentaries. It, the payment is integrated in the production support, so it's paid at the beginning, at the production, um, and then we ask them to make already a kind of basic uh, strategy, what they think that th they could do with this film. Um, so again, apart from the classical traditional uh, distribution, and then in the post-production stage, um, they have to make a written outreach strategy detailing the scope and also the larger possibilities of the outreach. And then one year after the, the premiere of the film, there they have to make really a detailed report um, and also indicate the areas for improvement. And um, this is something, um, it's very interesting. So there are a lot of people, um, the experts from film pact for, of the organization, the producers can um, engage these people or pay these people with the 4,000 euros because this support has to be um, used for um, making this outreach strategy because this is the most important thing. They have experience with uh, networking. They know all these like NGOs or um, partner orga organizations with whom they can organize screenings, but also with Q&As and um, really build a community with the audiences which can be very niche but it's really diffi difficult sometimes to find who are the ad audiences and how will we reach them so we are also um, stressing on the fact that in these times um, the use of social media or digital uh, communication is very important and so we also ask them to find the right people sometimes these are other people who are really experts in this kind of communication to get them also on board um, to yeah to get a broader audience and a broader um, uh, discussion on the film, also with press coverage etc. But it's it's in the in the same um, uh, topics as as the other speakers were talking about. It's li giving broadening uh, more than only a festival or or a cinema um, screenings. So that's in a nutshell, uh, the most important thing that we started like last year. Um, but we're working on it because um, we see that uh, mostly the uh, digital, the streaming uh, possibilities that it's quite difficult sometimes for documentary filmmakers to find the right platforms. It's okay if you have like um, a bigger documentary that is immediately picked up by the, by the bigger festivals. Um, and a really theatrical uh, big documentary, but, but if you have a smaller documentary, which is maybe um, not the ones that the big streamers will ask for, um, not the popular ones, um, then they are really looking, we had a discussion uh, last week, where can they find the right outlets to, to stream or to find uh, the platforms, also platforms that they will have a financial return that is still interesting because sometimes it's like they're just giving away the film for peanuts and uh, okay the film will be seen but and that's a, a difficult question right now I think for the industry. Thank you very much Natalie. I believe there is a lot of openness there is uh, also a lot of hope. Are there any questions from the audience? Now, I think that for many filmmakers, it's very important that there should be a feeling of uh, people thinking together, of people looking around for new possibilities. Would you like to add something? 
uh, as Natalie said, it's a matter of uh, role understanding, role conception. You are the director, you live with your project from A to Z, you know exactly what you want to do with this film, but uh, your ideas may change during the journey. And it's all the more important that um, um, during this journey, especially where outreach producers are concerned, there should be a possibility of reaching out to the public, of knowing how you're going to reach the the public, the audience. Uh, of course, the uh, audience may uh, uh, be critical as well, but you have to know how you can uh, really target and reach your audience because then you will have better chances. The model that we've done is not automatic support, but it involves uh, experts um, that to look at applications for marketing support and to evaluate them. We have about 40 such applications uh, in the various different categories. But the feedback that we kept hearing was sometimes uh, surprise about um, um, what people's expectations were of the film. Often uh, people think that a film is only going to be destined for the domestic market, the national market, but uh, a German film, for example, can be shown perfectly well in Austria or Switzerland. It can find an interested public there, but the customer journey that you see in the marketing blurb that is often not thought through properly. And this, this is, has something to do with know-how. And when the film is finished, the uh, director thinks that um, they immediately have to release the film. The uh, production by this stage is uh, involved with another film. So there you have to turn to the marketing prof professionals. And there we're talking about uh, conventional film distributors and sometimes uh, all people do is uh, bring out uh, a poster which may be uh, the directors like film director likes but not the market i've seen examples of this often a film is only observed in its own country and uh, when a film is shown in a different country, in Japan or USA, the poster and the trailer look quite different. And then sometimes uh, people ask the uh, director, um, have you seen that great poster in the USA? And uh, they haven't even seen it because this that was developed at the local level. So the competencies with regard to outreach and uh, input have to be uh, contributed by marketing specialists, marketing experts and specialists have to uh, contribute their skills to uh, the marketing of uh, films, distribution of films. And we are trying to promote this and assist with it and make it possible. So um, we are concerned with the uh, conventional, uh, we are too caught up with the conventional concepts. Sometimes the concepts that uh, people have in their heads are rather obsolete. For over 20 years now, marketing strategies and workshops and so on have been in existence. And yet in our organization, people are uh, often still surprised that people work with too many standards. The A festivals have also changed in the course of time. Well, if you want to go to the art house, what, does, what is an art house audience? Normally, the film directors don't really know uh, what an art house audience is. It's too general. We're doing media work, yes, but if do you want to discuss a film, do you want to discuss a, a feuilleton with your film? 
Or do you want to get through to film critics uh, in as much as they still exist? What is the aim? What do you want to talk about in the, in the media? It's not just enough to say that you've done that uh, with your film. You've taken testimonials and uh, you have uh, offered uh, partners for discussions. And uh, that's, uh, I think you proceeded in a slightly different way, did you not? Answer, yes, it was a question of cooperation. The producer had um, been interested in the film right from the beginning. They were not just interested in uh, uh, providing the money and doing the, the editing and uh, helping with the editing. Being a film director often means uh, working free of charge. Uh, it was never really regarded as uh, proper work. I'm hearing from all four sides that a lot of thought has to go into this process, this planning process, if you want to uh, create something together. And it's great to hear this. Now, unfortunately, we have to take a short break before we move on to the next panel. I would like to thank our participants very much indeed. Matthias Bürcher, Susa Katz and Natalie Capio. And then we will be talking in the second uh, section more about the contribution of state television channels. See you in a moment.
Euh, voilà, oui, c'est bon. OK. Bonjour. Ok, très bien. Ok. Oui. D'accord.
Welcome back. Ich möchte zuerst das Publikum online daran erinnern, dass man über die Chat-Funktion unten ähm, First of all, I would like to remind the online audience that you can ask questions online. Now we're going to start with the second panel. I would like to introduce. Uh, I would like to welcome Pierre Adrien Ierle, project leader from Play Suisse, and then Christophe Azizad from France, who is head of fiction documentary division at TV5 Monde. I wish you a warm welcome. Then in the studio, we have Elena Tati, a producer from Box Productions, a co-president of Europa, the Romand Association of the Audiovisual Production, and David Bernet, film director, co-president of AG Dog. I would like to ask you about the motivation and the objectives of Swiss uh, television. I'm going to be speaking French. So I'd like to speak in French uh, now. The motivation for Play Swiss, there, well, there are several motivating factors, but I think that the main such factor with regard to users and the public was from the beginning to be able to provide a national offering to bring together in a single platform producers from all of the different regions of Switzerland and to give the public a thematic vision subtitled in all of the national languages for Switzerland. Now, this is something that was made possible thanks to modern day technology, and this in turn enabled us to decompartmentalize the different Swiss regions, to open up to the, the audiovisual landscape, to provide this national catalog for the first time on a single platform. Play Swiss has been in existence for about four or five months. What kind of experiences have you had uh, with this? Um, with with uh, what kind of experience have you had with creative long documentaries in the current pandemic context? So the experience is very positive overall. After several months of operation, we have realized that the public is there, they're on the platform, there is demand, there is genuine demand for the catalog that we put together. And our experience with documentary films is also very positive because naturally our catalog is primarily composed of documentaries. Switzerland produces a lot more documentaries than fiction films. This is also because it's seen as a public service mission. And thanks to the platform, we were able to really showcase not only recent documentaries that were recently produced, but also what was even more interesting. Um, and this opens up new possibilities. We revisited the catalog of the past. This means that we can really value things that were produced several years ago because we uh, highlight a thematic, a theme, an issue. We provide a perspective on something from various productions that were made over the years, regardless of the producing region. To give you an example, we had we put together thematic collections on various topics, such as a women's right to vote, the 50 years of the SSR, uh, Switzerland through the Second uh, World War, through the series Triton, and we, documentaries produced over the years that provided this insight uh, from a regional perspective and above all cultural insights through the uh, production of documentaries that we already had in our catalog. And do you have any initial figures which give us an idea of the proportion between uh, documentaries and uh, TV production? Uh, uh, have you got an idea of the demand? How interested is the TV audience? Okay, it's interesting to note, and I think that this is, comes as a surprise for no one. Today, fiction on our platform, but on all of the platform, remains the main locomotive in terms of volume, especially fictionalized series. We notice that there is a very impressive effect 
if we look at a series like Freedom, uh, uh, Vinda, which was very successful, this really draws a public, a public in all the different regions, the different parts of Switzerland. However, documentaries have also been relatively successful. We, with the, the history of the ski, skiing, which was a real hit on our platform because it was a very popular theme, obviously. And this was shown in February and there were other documentaries as well. But I would say that today, the uh, track record after a few months, uh, fiction series really generate specific strong interest, whereas documentaries today are on more varied and more specific topics and really are regularly in the top 10 list of uh, films that are hits on our platform. but. Uh, on what we call favorite themes, uh, such as skiing or a portrait of Uli Stett, who was a well-known figure, or uh, documentaries on uh, themes that bring the Swiss together. And it will be interesting in the months to come to keep on working together and try to understand how we can use fiction, fiction and documentary properly on the platform. Another question, how do you handle promotion? How do you coordinate promotion? Your aim is to um, focus uh, more on longer documentaries. What's your strategy? In terms of curation, I, I think that that is a very important word for us to switch uh, because we have a mixed approach between a strong editorialization because we have a team that really editorializes the collections that really strives within the different regional units to look at identify the different productions so that they can put together this thematic collection and we do this based on current topics themes that might be more of interest to us at a present at the present moment but as a complement to this editorialized approach this is backed up by a field where we are are gradually deploying and this is personalized recommendations because our catalog is extremely broad we're talking about thousands of films if we only rely on editorialization then everyone is only going to look at the very tip of the iceberg for the catalog but there are a lot of things that are below the tip of the iceberg in the catalog and we have to bring that back up to the surface and we can do this with tools, uh, recommendation-based tools, then we can work together to try to exploit the catalog to resurface certain themes, certain documentaries. And this will be based on the preferences of uh, individual preferences. This is the kind of area that we're working in, but also with regard to collections where we are going to uh, automate uh, more generalized recommendations, for example, what uh, uh, t what documentaries are pro popular in Switzerland or in one region rather than another? What kind of in light can we shed on certain themes based on the success uh, um, for different criteria? Christoph Azizat, uh, a few months ago, TV5 World uh, decided to go the same way with TV5 Plus. Can you tell us something about your strategies and about the experiences that you've had in the first few months? Can you tell us something about uh, those experiences in the first few months? Uh, oui, bien sûr. Uh, yes, of course. Je vais, je vais répéter I'm going qui a dit, to repeat uh, a little bit of what que the previous speaker just said, les règles et because les codes the rules sont quand même and the codes for platforms are more or less identical from one platform to another. Uh, uh, now, with de, de regard TV5, to the TV5 platform, this uh, really responds to the 
channel's mission, which is to promote the French language throughout the world and their partnerships with various French-speaking uh, units, for example, in Belgium. And this platform was launched in September 2020, and there are about 4,000 program hours already. These are generalized. You can find the youth films, sports, uh, documentaries, all different categories. And documentaries account for about 25% uh, about 1,000 broadcast hours of the 4,000 total. Alors, juste pour now, ne pas répéter, euh, to, parce on, on travaille so sur, sur les mêmes choses, notre spécificité à nous, c'est uh, que c'est le regard croisé, c'est-à-dire que sur une thématique précise, par exemple, sur une thématique assez, uh, assez bateau, mais if we take a relatively le jour de la journée theme, de, de, des droits de la femme, par exemple, on va nous proposer des documentaires issus de chaque partenaire qui ont construit quelque chose 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 qui ont construit Really different. Et en terme In terms of le public, nous openness to the public, we have a distinguishing characteristic. We work together, for example, de de dans with the French-speaking language professors, about one million Et of them throughout the world. And this platform pour, is very pour useful pour to them pour pour for the classes to provide support to really conquer the new French-speaking voilà. public. Ça, and above and beyond this, yes, indeed, there are various Uh, the comme, thematic approaches pour la, comme pour RTS Play, for, uh, uh, as for or, uh, RTS Play. Play. We also work with fiction, but also through recommendations. It is up to us to really attract the fiction public to documentaries by saying, well, you know, on the platform, we have a documentary that uh, looks at the same topic. So establishing this kind of a link this kind of a cross-cutting link, this really helps highlight documentaries. Voilà, en gros, ce que je peux vous so dire that is what I could say. What would be interesting would be to know what the conditions are for a big documentary film that you wish to uh, buy and which you're going to show. Uh, um, you, you have uh, millions of viewers. Uh, what, what are the conditions that you work with under such, uh, in such a situation? Euh, alors d'abord, il faut qu'il soit well, en langue française. First of all, it has to be in French, in French language, because that is the prerequisite. Because we broadcast in French and we subtitle in foreign languages. Ensuite, nous Now, sommes généralistes, c'est-à-dire qu'on est ouvert à tous les sujets. Approach. C'est-à-dire que si vous allez sur notre plateforme, la thématisation, ça va de documentaire découverte à you will have a discovery, uh, something discovering African culture, something like that. Okay. À partir de là, on, on peut Now, accepter un nombre de this, choses uh, accept, uh, assez. Notre, uh, pardon, notre, para, notre, our, notre terrain de jeu est, est assez large. Our playing field is rather broad. Yes. Donc on n'a pas d'a priori. So we don't have any preconceptions in this respect. Now, what, of course, is um, uh, a question for us as filmmakers here, uh, how long is the uh, running time for a documentary film? How much does a platform such as yours uh, pay for the acquisition of a film? How much do you pay? Alors, ça, ça, je, je peux difficilement well, it's a little bit hard for me to give you a specific de, answer de because that depends on a great many parameters. Voilà. Donc, ça dépend so de, de la durée depends, des droits, de, for example, du territoire que nous achetons, how long we buy the rights for the territory and the runtime of the documentary itself. Okay, thank you. Elena Tati, you as a producer, how do you assess the opportunities and dangers of this new platform, which is probably going to become an important player for the evaluation and the broadcasting of long documentaries? As a producer, <laughs> The sound is very bad. The... There's a problem with the speaker's mic. <laughs> no, we 
have we have seen several different things uh, for instance when documentaries were launched So, as a producer, I was very enthusiastic to see the first phase of the launch in Switzerland. For us, uh, listening to what was said by Pierre Adrien, well, clearly, this is a a great opportunity for us to really ha relive the catalog. So what has happened is that the SSR uh, acquired some of the rights to a lot of our films. So obviously for films that were already in a, a kind of a downturn, this is a real opportunity to uh, for these films to really have a second life and to, to if they go on the play swiss platform so this is the first thing i wanted to say obviously it's a little more complicated for some of our films which are films in they're already in their commercial career and this career hasn't fended yet so concretely i had cases of two films that won the swiss filmmakers award and uh, in recent years and so these films were we acquired the rights to them they were produced by tele club so uh, this uh, what i do is i had to negotiate a shortening of the, the window for the vod um in tele club i did so because this was in my best interest to do so these are real film d'auteur and uh, on platforms like the one teleclub one by swisscom which uh, don't come up with huge audience figures so so uh, it was also in my interest to negotiate with teleclub so that we could go get them into the vod platform faster so this is not always the case obviously if we're talking about a fiction film it has a longer commercial run so for the vod platform then things are a bit different now i'm also explaining this because today this there's a chronology factor for the media with regard to vod in switzerland this is really part of the audiovisual landscape up until 2023. This is also within the frame, present day framework where all of the co-productions, uh, joint productions are uh, shown first and also the agreement uh, according to this agreement for fiction films made for cinema and also documentaries there is an opting out clause for producers to enable commercial exploitation before these films go on to these vod platforms so i would say that this has worked out for the best in the audiovisual landscape and i so this is has to do with the relationship between the ssr for example and independent filmmakers so that is another factor now i would also add that uh, to come back to the question of the future i would say that there will probably be an entire system that will have to be rethought uh, as of 2024 um so there the question will be what can we do and will the ssr move more and more towards uh, non-binary binary so and then this raises a host of additional questions 
which are linked to, for example, payment of royalties. Um, and so here, there is a whole field that we will really have to rediscuss in coming years. And this uh, more generally, I think there's also the question of how Swiss films in the near future, uh, how there can we can find alternatives to joint production, to funding and so on through other uh, distributors other than uh, 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 SSR. So there have uh, there are ongoing discussions uh, with regard which uh, provide for an extension of the reinvestment uh, format uh, of the 4% of uh, uh, distributors in the audiovisual landscape which probably will be broadened to include the platforms and the key distributors, the Swiss platforms, and also foreign platforms broadcasting in Switzerland. So here as well, I think there are things, things are going to really bring some change with regard to the issues at stake. David Bernet, as a representative of the film directors, um, where do you see the opportunities and risks of these new free of charge online platforms? Well, I'm not only a representative of the directors, but also of uh, producers of the association that represents the whole industry in uh, Germany as well. Um, in, in Germany, I, I'm Swiss, but I've been in Germany for many years. So uh, my experience concerns mainly the German region. Our experience uh, has been positive. We've just received some figures about the utilization of uh, documentary films and documentary uh, productions in general in AID and uh, uh, ZRF and also in uh, third party medias, for example, uh, YouTube. Now, from these figures, it's become clear that the offering of short uh, journalistic uh, documentary films is much greater than creative documentaries, but the use of the creative documentaries is much greater. The creative documentary films are shown a lot in videotheques, whereas in, the, in Germany they are not uh, normally shown in the normal uh, uh, product, pro program schedules of uh, TV channels. Now the making films available online would mean that uh, a larger audience would have more opportunity to see those films. And that, of course, is a good piece of news. The other point is that, uh, as has already been mentioned, what does the topic mean for the rights? Are we still in the same situation as before? In Germany, at the beginning of this year, we recently started after two years of negotiations to um, uh, set up a new uh, uh, system which uh, is based on the uh, previous uh, evaluation for um, uh, broadcasting of films and um, there have been some big changes in our agreement it says that um, we will have to find a solution for remuneration of media tax uh, by the end of this year uh, how are we going to settle the problem of uh, copyright uh, remuneration for media techs? Uh, we will have to solve this problem of uh, remuneration by the end of this year. So we don't have a whole year. We have only uh, six months and certain standards are being set. Netflix is very busy all over Europe in making such agreements with the willing associations all over Europe. And we have to consider how we are going to handle this because it's not necessarily something that we are going to like. 
Therefore, I think we will really have to agree among ourselves uh, as to how we can transpose the old existing system into a system of uh, uh, online uh, screening moderator that's going to be a big uh, question how much value are we going to attach to online screening things are going to change how do you see this uh, if uh, um, online platforms are going to be set up by state tv uh, channels and uh, maybe a rather heretic question but um, uh, is there going to be more support for uh, uh, free of charge screenings and um, I think state to, state TV channel in Switzerland wants to do more to uh, promote a free of charge a screening of films in Switzerland because uh, it's young people who watch them how can we handle this well I'm going to show you the point of view of uh, uh, Play Suisse uh, um, Play Suisse is not a free of charge platform because it's uh, financed within the context of the ordinary budget of uh, uh, Swiss uh, radio and television, which is paid for by the television license fee. So it's already paid for. It's not free of charge. It would be almost strange to ask for additional money to get access to programs which are largely financed by the public service and already financed by the Swiss television license fee so it's not a free of charge uh, platform proper but access is free it's free access this is maybe the problem that producers might encounter with uh, films that are in a more commercial phase but we are reflecting on solutions we are going to be able to change and develop our platform in order to be able to receive those films uh, depending on the criteria which we're going to be able to define together with the associations i would remind you that um, this initiative is not um, one for a platform which is going to function and progress without consulting people the purpose of play suisse is to move forward for and with independent producers because it, is, because it is they who constitute our catalogue. Without independent production, Play Suisse will not have any raison d'etre. So our aim is to cooperate with them in the future. Our platform is only five months old. It's a young baby. And um, it has a considerable way to progress still. And in this area, the area of uh, fees and rights, um, the way in which films are uh, uh, publicized at the beginning of their career, and then the various criteria for determining the degree of access, uh, more freer access or less free access. Christoph Azizat, what is the situation uh, with you? Your platform is um, only seven months old, just two months uh, older than the platform of Play Suisse, uh, because you can reach a global market with your program offering. So what's the situation with you? Okay, well, actually, uh, yes, I'm sorry, we can't hear you. Uh, we can't hear you there. Yes, okay, now we can hear you. So we are free, obviously, okay, because we cannot really envisage that uh, public service cannot be free. Well, this is because it's already funded by the state. We have signed agreements with different bodies that represent the uh, authors, the artists, the uh, the performers and so on and so forth so above and beyond this once again we ourselves are facing the same problems that is we have to cover the entire world with a variety of programs which make it possible to reach the users so that is what i had to say Thank you, Christoph. I would like to ask the audience if you have any questions. And does anyone from the audience have any questions to ask?
I have a question. What is the link between linear linear TV and Play Swiss? What are your plans for that? They appear to be two completely different worlds of two different uh, audiences consisting of two different audiences. Should there not be more linkage? Today, today the link between the linear and uh, linear TV and Play Swiss is relatively close. Why is it relatively close? Well, because on the one hand, as far as new productions are concerned, we bring them out when they are available. So when talking about documentaries, um, thinking about uh, documentaries shown on temps présent, uh, which are franchises of uh, RTS, these are documentaries which are completed relatively shortly before they are broadcast and then we have a whole subtitling job to do which takes time so in fact we then start bumping up against this broadcasting date now the other aspect is more like a legal uh, limitation and that is sponsoring a certain number of our programs benefit from sponsoring for their broadcasting and the Ofcom rules are very clear for sponsoring. You cannot broadcast a spon sponsored content uh, um, on linear television more than 24 uh, hours in advance. So uh, sponsored uh, showings constitute a considerable proportion of our catalog and there we have to respect the difference between uh, linear uh, TV uh, showings and online showings. Now does that uh, reflect the current uh, trend? Uh, well, maybe not. We are moving towards a delinearization of production, but that's a discussion which um, uh, TSR will have to have more in future with Ofcom in order to move more into line with current trends. So at the moment we don't enjoy complete freedom, but as regards the whole of the past catalogue, which uh, consists represents a considerable uh, proportion of our offering, there we can operate freely and uh, there's quite a bit of consumption of contents which are not linked to linear uh, showing or uh, um, or online but which are specific to play swiss elena you wanted to say something i have a question which concerns more what I've uh, seen, um, I think there is a strong uh, editorial, editorialization force for new uh, contents and uh, highlighting these new contents, uh, uh, programization of the platform. So, but I have wondered what the strengths or weaknesses are of the promotion of new content. I had the impression that particularly as regards communication, um, which uh, stays on the web, in other words, uh, social uh, media, uh, of the platform and the brand, but that that promotion was fairly limited. That's what I've observed. Maybe that's just my own individual observation, although I don't think so. And I also wondered to what extent SSR intends to uh, further develop its uh, online production capacities and uh, what are the limits that we might have as uh, public broadcasters. Well, there's the marketing and communication aspect. Um, we we'll differentiate the two as regards uh, marketing. That can be done non-paying, in an organic uh, manner. And there we start from scratch. We don't have a base of uh, fans on the social media, so we would be starting from scratch. Now, when you but uh, when starting from scratch, we have some levers that we can actuate. We continue to have a marketing budget, which was extremely moderate, moderate compared with other platforms. For example, Disney Plus has had a marked presence in Switzerland for more than one year. 
uh, in Switzerland with a um, very strong presence in digital and out of home and so on. But we don't have the same ability to invest in marketing, but we do so nevertheless. What do we do? We use cross-promotion tools. We promote uh, programs with um, linear channels, but sometimes this poses uh, in-house competition problems, so we have to be very targeted. We did it very well with uh, Wilder. We have been gaining some experience of this, and we also do work on the social media to go out and look for um, audience on the social media and we offer them the Play Suisse uh, brand and the content um, that we offer via the social media. We do uh, teasing of the audience, audience teasing. So we really are in this uh, brand awareness phase for the time being. And then we are going to do sporadic campaigns. What we can see emerging is the different channels. And we also have our newsletter, which is a formidable a tool for communication with our grassroots. We have a very high proportion of people uh, on the Play Suisse who enroll for the newsletter, which enables us to announce new programs and uh, collections and to announce new things. Now, with a combination of all these channels, we manage to identify very clearly what works, what does not, and then we can redirect our marketing effort with the small budget that we have towards the initiatives which are the most effective. Now, I think that um, we will have a big challenge in the future because our surveys uh, tell us that about 30 percent, about one third of the population really does identify uh, Play, Play Suisse um, platform as, as a brand, but we still have quite a long way to go and we hope to do that in the next few months. And we have also uh, set up a marketing team. Initially, we had a launch um, campaign, but uh, now we really do have a marketing team. We work on traffic, we work on this social media, on community management, and the acquisition of new users and reactivating the uh, the base, the grassroots. So these are the topics that we'll be concerned with in the next few months. Christophe, as is that, uh, how do you do that? Uh, how, do, how do you do the same thing at TV Cinq Monde? Well, the difference, as I see it with RTS Play in the case at hand, is that we are in a logic of uh, audiovisual support. Now, what I mean here is, regardless of the user, Peu importe que l'utilisateur donc regarde TV5 Monde en linéaire, uh, whether the plus, user watches us uh, on linear or on the platform, Alors, the important thing is that he watches TV5 World. Alors, nous, nous so, avions, nous un peu plus équipés, sans we doute, were RTS, perhaps sens, better equipped in, in that we already had a social network. Nous avions déjà une offre, we par exemple, already SVOD had an SVOD offering for Africa. Donc, on ne part pas de zéro. On peut utiliser so we're not starting from scratch. We could rely on all of the marketing elements that were already present. And above all, once again, we are free, but the user must subscribe to our platform so we can really personalize offerings. We can advise our users on a personalized basis. With our modest means, we can do this as well. A small comment, if I may, based on my experience, uh, subscription is not uh, compulsory on the TV5+. Plus. Uh, that is a difference with uh, Play Swiss, where subscription is compulsory so that people can watch content. If it, it's possible to clarify this and confirm this or not, uh, is subscription compulsory on TV5 World+. Plus? Well, the sorry, subscription is not compulsory, but to have access to all of the different services, for example, uh, the recommendations and so on and so forth. Yes, there you have to subscribe. 
nur sagen, weil wenn es jetzt um Promotion geht, solche Dinge, ich glaube, no, um, das Wesentliche she would like to come in here. When we're talking about promotion, uh, what we have, the most important thing is to preserve the diversity of the different uh, ways and means. In the past, we had to um, look to see uh, how we could find the audience uh, for such and such a film and where. The reason was that creative documentary films um, get the biggest uh, audience in television evaluation, but um, the festivals are extremely important and the creativity of uh, creative uh, documentary films and, and the incentive to make such creative documentary films is created by uh, festivals and other similar events. So I think that even though uh, platforms will play an increasingly important role in the perception of uh, uh, creative documentaries, I believe the uh, analog for uh, festivals and so on will still be very important, even though I think that uh, digital is a good development. <laughs> Moderator, well, that's uh, an excellent summary uh, of the second section of this morning's pre proceedings. I would like to thank uh, those of you who were with us in the studio, and I would also like to thank um, those of you who have been joining us online. We will take a short break of a few minutes, and then we will be talking about the evaluation possibilities of um, documentary films from the layman's point of view. Thank you.
Can you hear me now? You know what? I had a microphone and my headphones on. Now I turned them both off and it works. So <laughs> we just. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I think I'm the only non-Swiss person. <laughs> I think I think so. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> you too. <laughs> On Sunday morning. <laughs> I was listening, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. No, not until May 17th. So. Yeah, and will people go? I mean, have you been open on and off? We opened in the summer and then closed again, and so, and then a little bit in December and closed again. So, Yeah, I guess events, people have to feel like there's a reason to go to the cinema more. Yeah. And where are you? Mm. Yeah. And we're a distributor who launched a virtual cinema platform. So we work closely now with cinemas. Yeah. <laughs> I know I was trying to think of a good Swiss connection, but uh, we haven't really released any Swiss films, not lately anyway, but just documentary, um, quite a few documentaries. Although we also release features. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Should I mute the audio, original audio? No. Automatically, okay. Welcome back to the third and last part of our panel discussion, which is about the opportunities of new uh, creative uh, possibilities for making documentary films. I'd like to welcome Misha Shivov, distributor, Frenetic Films, co-president of the Agency for Film Production. Then we have with us Tobias Faust, co-director of Cult. Kino and the streaming channel myfilm.ch. Thank you. 
and also Eve Cabarro, founder and managing director of Modern Films. You are at Modern Films, are distributors and virtual cinema uh, partners. You offer alternatives to traditional viewing uh, across various uh, media and uh, windows. Now, what what Sorry, what exactly does does that, does that mean? I can't hear the English translation. Oh. <laughs> The, the, asking, the interpreter um, was uh, was you, translating. Um, um, naming yourself as virtual cinema partners. And you're offering alternatives to the traditional film um, distribution across borders, media and windows, as you call it. What does that mean? Yeah, so traditionally we're a distribution company who release films in cinemas and then across other rights. And since March last year, we also launched a virtual cinema platform, which is, you know, with a capital V and a capital C, I think it's a new term um, on how we release films online, but in this theatrical window so that we are positioning the film release as still part of the cinema release. So we partner with cinemas and with cultural organizations on building virtual screening rooms for them. So you buy a ticket from the cinema, but you watch it online, but it's all branded as them. So I suppose that's the difference of create, it's different from premium VOD or from digital release or VOD itself, because we partner with the cinemas and the cinema brands and the traffic um, and the social media and the outreach all comes from them. So it's an important uh, partnership and distinction, I think, between the way we used to release with cinemas or the way we release digitally. And, what and on that platform, we've released um, five films this year, um, some of them hybrid of theatrical when we were open um, a little bit, but some of them purely virtual, but all in connection with cinemas themselves. And what were your first experiences with it? How does it work? How, how much yeah. the audience, um, yeah. Well, the cinemas work differently. It's, I mean, it's been a hard time to create a model because some cinemas are operating behind the scenes, even if they're closed. Some have all the staff furloughed, some have greater marketing outreach uh, from before. Um, so the ones that do have marketing in-house or, or good mailing lists and, and followings, they do much better than the ones that don't. But trying to create a model is really trying to communicate with audiences for new releases through press and then through, through kind of organic growth and marketing marketing. But yeah, the main thing has been to see how audiences understand what virtual cinema is, how they respond to it, where they find out about it. And really, it does come down to the films connecting with, with people. So we've been really working on this idea of finding out about films still through your cinema. And um, each film finds its niche. I think they're, the niche films do very well. Um, if they're maybe it's harder with with bigger films, but then they tend to go to wider um, digital platforms. So there's this differentiation, I suppose, of what is Netflix, what is Amazon Prime, what is watching virtual cinema and, and buying a ticket, so, you know, working on this idea that the price is like a ticket, it's like going to the cinema. So creating a model, we've done a lot of um, events in conjunction with the releases and the events we tend to do for free and not geo-blocked and then the films geo-blocked and transactional priced, um, which also has been a lot of messaging <laughs> around that. But I think that works for now and we'll see what the future is when cinemas open and then there's a connection between a virtual ticket, a physical ticket, uh, in situ event, uh, online event, and how they can all kind of complement each other. And I've read on your page that you're often talking about impact distribution and outreach strategies. Can you tell a little bit more about how precisely you're working with it and what's, what's your work on it, how you use it? Yeah, I think it's just an extension really of grassroots marketing. Um, this impact idea is working with um, social organizations that uh, directly relate to the themes maybe in the film particularly for documentary this works very well you know last year we released a film called white riot which is a british documentary about the rock against racism movement in the 70s and our preview campaign online we, we had originally planned it with music festivals um, and we did do that online with all the big music festivals throughout the summer. But then we also coincided with a major <laughs> global movement around Black Lives Matter. So we were able to connect with a lot of social issues 
um, and news related organizations and what we build also are virtual screening rooms for organizations so we go beyond the cinema to offer tickets um, and events and people begin to respond to that in different ways or we work on a film called clemency which is about it's a narrative feature but it's about the death penalty in the u.s and and, and living on death row and there we were able to connect with social justice agencies who actually performed very, very well, as well as cinemas, if not better. Or we had a, a film called Beyond the Visible about Hilma Afklint, the um, abstract expressionist Swedish painter. And we worked with um, art fairs and um, galleries to promote that online and built virtual screening rooms for them. So that's really what the impact is, I suppose, digging deeper into organizations that are connected to the film and then um, building screening rooms for them and outreach packages. We build social assets and um, marketing packages for each of them to be able to roll out. Thank you very much. Um, Tobias Faust, your cool Kino had ja eigentlich Tobias Faust, your cult kino, has uh, set up a virtual cinema room. Now, is there a difference between your platform and the VOD platforms? But um, maybe the idea is to reach the same uh, public, the same audience, but through different uh, means. What kind of experience have you had? Uh, with this in Switzerland so much. Tobias Faust, thank you for the invitation. In 2019, we uh, brought our VOD platform online. And of course, that was practical for uh, the coronavirus pandemic, which uh, ensued, but it was not really welcomed so much at the time. The reason was fairly trivial. We had operated libraries uh, for quite some time and uh, had sold DVDs, but technology had changed. And uh, we wanted to make the films that we had shown in cinemas available uh, to our audience. That was the original intention of the VOD uh, platform. Then, of course, some things changed with the coronavirus pandemic. Our platform became known. We had to handle the technical uh, aspects uh, pretty quickly in order to be able to continue to provide the digital offering. Now you've uh, mentioned virtualization of cinema. And uh, here we're talking about linearization of cinema. Um, and um, well, in fact, we don't have so much of experience of linearization of cinema and selling uh, tickets. We have made uh, our films available online at the price of cinema tickets. But technologically, this would be comparable to conventional VOD. And you can uh, call down the films uh, at the normal price, even though it's a premiere. Uh, the question is what will actually happen when we uh, virtualize uh, cinema and uh, when you can see the films at a certain time. We cannot say that much about that, but what we can say on the basis of the experience we've had with coronavirus, we're in the process of uh, completely rebuilding the platform. We're moving away from the old original um, uh, catalog-based technology. Now we are much more present with the customer thanks to apps. So we have a better knowledge of the customer's needs. And now we can do variations on all the possibilities. In future, we will be able to combine events um, with uh, recordings without any problem. Uh, we want to do various different combinations as regards the catalog itself. Technically speaking, that's the simplest thing, and uh, we've already solved that problem. But there, there are very different uh, challenges that we see at the moment. We have over 500 films, and the question of the orientation of the films, 
that's not really such a problem because the volume of 500 films is relatively small compared with the volume of films that Netflix has. So um, the question is how we're going to orientate this uh, offering. Now, thanks to the screens and thanks to the places and thanks to the selection of uh, uh, films, uh, this uh, orientation uh, normally uh, restricts the public, the audience, but that restriction no longer exists so much online. And um, when, when you're showing films online, people don't necessarily understand it if you uh, artificially create a, a shortage of availability by restricting the, the availability of uh, films that are shown online. What does it mean for you, cinema operators? Uh, I believe the cinemas in Switzerland are slowly opening again, as from tomorrow, I believe. So you've already got some experience in uh, digital space. Uh, how are things going to proceed? Do you think you are going to contribute to making cinemas uh, more attractive? How are you going to handle this uh, parallel uh, hybrid uh, evaluation of uh, cinemas, uh, cinema theaters and uh, online showing? Answer, we're already uh, planning and implementing We've already uh, uh, changed uh, one part of our program. Um, we've already uh, changed some uh, cinemas. Three further ones can be retrofitted. Specifically, what does this mean? Now we're going to have a film uh, festival in June, which is going to be shown in some of our uh, cinemas. And there we want to uh, be able to live stream uh, some of the talks and discussions and we want to be able to stream the films in a time critical manner as far as the uh, end product is concerned uh, we have a welcome we uh, screen the film and after the film we have a discussion and this is uh, all takes place in a time critical manner and uh, based on a cinema ticket so we're in the process of uh, re-equipping the uh, cinemas and uh, and the uh, technology also has to be altered now you referred to the attractiveness of uh, cinemas uh, well at the moment we don't really see any competition between the two different uh, formats don't think there's any point in simply virtualizing cinema and saying that online is a virtual cinema uh, online is a technology it's not really a format I think we can uh, transpose other formats than the cinema better to uh, to online. Of course, you can make uh, separations between the, the different contents. There are quite a lot of opportunities in this area, but I don't think that uh, cinemas really are threatened in their existence. It always bothers me when um, people say or claim that um, cinemas are uh, places worthy of protection. Some cinemas in Switzerland can uh, uh, defend their position very well and are uh, autonomous uh, and um, they cannot really be attacked in their viability by, by the internet. Michel Shivov, uh, as a distributor and film promoter, what do you think of these new developments? What about a parallel uh, evaluation online and in uh, cinema with the new uh, forms of promotion? Answer? No, I think um, what Tobias Faust was telling us is really fantastic that these uh, all these different possibilities exist and he really is a pioneer in these new uh, hybrid forms of evaluation, in these new uh, hybrid uh, virtual cinemas, cinema theaters. I have the impression that we've really arrived in a new 
world. I listened to the other panel participants as well. And uh, based on what they said, I think we really are in a new world. And um, I feel a little bit embarrassed in that respect because I am still operating largely in the old world. So we are caught up in an economy in which this new way of thinking is not really possible. We have the impression that we are still highly dependent on the cinema theatres. We cannot just pick out some uh, films and show them virtually, although there are some examples um, uh, of that. And uh, economically, it uh, does not work out. The uh, sums just don't work out for us. So cinemas, theatres really are still important for us. And they should remain the place where films are largely shown. Now in uh, Switzerland, documentaries uh, have an opportunity to reach uh, a large uh, audience. Uh, one uh, company has uh, brought out 20 documentary films in the last few years, and uh, the audience was about 500,000 people. And per film, I've worked it out, there are about 13 to 15,000 uh, viewers per film. But of course, today that has all been caused in, called into question. We don't know what the future is going to look like. Uh, we don't know what the numbers are going to look like as soon as cinemas uh, reopen very soon in Switzerland. We don't know whether cinema theatres will be able to uh, defend themselves or uh, whether people will go to other places and, uh, and uh, use different channels which are cheaper. So from uh, a distributor's perspective, this is a big question. So the question is, will we be able to survive uh, economically? Look now, one uh, important film distributor in Switzerland has gone out of business. About uh, two and a half years ago, uh, Look Now stopped their activity. They went out of business. And I've done a count. There are seven uh, film distributors that are working with Swiss documentaries, and each and every company is under quite a lot of pressure at the moment. We don't know what the future is going to look like. And we don't know whether we will be able to continue with this um, film distribution business. Now, there's one thing which I thought was rather strange, and that is that the promoters maintain that today it does not really matter whether a film is shown in a, a theater or on uh, other platforms, uh, virtually, uh, in other words, virtually. But um, up to now, I have not understood it that way. And I think the rest of the world has not necessarily understood it that way either. People who knock on our door want to show their uh, films in cinema theaters. It's uh, not necessarily, the, it's not just the case um, that a film looks better on a big screen, but um, it depends on the audience. And uh, most of the revenues that are earned by films are earned at the box office and cinema theaters. And, um, and uh, I, I don't think it makes much sense for uh, uh, cinemas to set up online platforms. And um, also it does not make much sense to me if uh, uh, people have to go via a cinema to, to purchase a ticket to, to, uh, to see uh, something in other media. And the, these are leftovers from the old world in which I am imprisoned at the moment. So I hope that the promoters will help us to uh, enter into the new world. Moderator. Do you have a translation in English now or not? Do you have a do translation have in a English? Translation in English, or do I have to speak in English to you? I can't hear her. Yeah. Sorry, I was listening to the translation, but oh, for so me to be on, it's off. <laughs> so in English would be good. Thanks. Okay. Um, we we were talking about. Um, Misha was talking about the financial 
um, difficulties that are coming up with um, all these online platforms and, and that there is much less money for distributor also to, to receive means also for producers, for filmmakers. Um, how is your experience and how do you see the future? Or how can you handle this aspect of the financial maybe loss or maybe not? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I agree that it doesn't um, match the finance of, of theatrical distribution, but I think it is an interesting complement, and it does cater to people who still want to support their local cinema, but maybe they can't go for timing reasons, financial reasons, even geographical reasons. Uh, so it, it does, uh, I think it enhances the cinema experience if it's positioned as such, so it isn't positioned as just a film that's available on all digital platforms everywhere at the same time. So that's why this sort of early window is really important and the connection to how, how you watch it, even if you watch it at home. But you know, I agree, theatrical distribution is, is one thing and virtual cinema is another, but if we can connect the two, then I think there's an interesting new model of both viewing and, and of box office revenues and how they're calculated. And this is something that we've been talking about as an industry as well, is how do we include virtual box office into gross box office and admissions? Because it's, it's significant at the moment. Um, again, maybe in a year's time, <laughs> we can talk again and we'll look at what was last year, what was this year, and what is next year, because there, there's nothing normal about the numbers this year. But what we have seen on our platform, anyway, is a growth, a tremendous growth. And I think it comes from an understanding of what virtual cinema is, um, but also connecting with audiences through marketing um, and outreach. So it, it, it is something viable and interesting and growing, but it, it isn't there to replace cinema, for sure. And how you will handle in the future um, the possibilities with the windows and with the hybrid parallel um, distribution means same yeah, time in the UK, Yeah, I mean, in the UK, we have a lot more freedom around windows, particularly if we just work with independent cinemas. And we've had this history of years of, of day and date, as it was called. Um, I think it's it's changed a lot in the last year of what that means and which cinemas are willing to show films, particularly in documentary. You know, even the multiplexes and the independent cinemas that that insist on a full window um, before any other rights are exploited are open to screenings of documentaries uh, within a context of maybe a strand or or a theme or an event. So um, I think that will just grow. And it will be good. It's been very good for documentary, I think, in, in general. But it is to be seen how the cinemas respond. We can see already in the UK, it's now gone from four months to should be 45 day window um, between theatrical and, and digital rights. But it's a different conversation, I think, in the UK than, than most of the rest of the world, maybe the US as well, where there is flexibility already that's not tied to, to production finance and, and national um, restrictions and chronology of media. Thank you. Um, Tobias, in the Schweiz haben wir eine ähnliche Situation. In Switzerland, Tobias, we have a similar situation. We don't have this very wide time window. How are you going to uh, handle these time windows or uh, time delayed uh, windows uh, after the end of the pandemic? And so what's certainly an interesting discussion. And uh, previously I made this rather heretic uh, remark about the need to protect uh, theaters. My colleague mentioned the possibility of um, only subsidizing a film uh, on a platform if someone uh, chooses a particular uh, cinema theater, and uh, if they choose a different cinema theater, then they don't get subsidies, which is rather strange. But here we're talking about a chronology. We're talking about the possibility of protecting this uh, uh, chain, but we're still caught up in an economy which will inevitably change whether we want it to or not. I think we will do ourselves a uh, favor if we don't reason so much in terms of the uh, timeline, but in terms of the quality. We as operators, as cinema operators, are convinced that we have an audience and that we can reach that uh, audience. 
and uh, we succeed in doing that here in Basel pretty successfully. But the assumption that uh, uh, the audience only comes to see the film because the film is shown in a particular theater, uh, that's an assumption that I would don't really want to make. There is a reason, historical reason, why things have developed that way, which we don't really even need to state. But um, I think uh, theatres will come under pressure. And the question is, how can we ensure, how can we uh, you apply the quality of the different uh, media in future? In the first section of the panel, uh, we heard that um, film producers and film directors uh, have already reached out to the public, to the audience. Now, often we are confronted with a 60-minute documentary film, which originally was intended for television screening, but because of the uh, subsidization uh, logic, it ended up in the theater. I think such uh, logical reasonings uh, will probably have to change in future. Now, uh, cinemas um, generate a certain value in, in terms of the timeline. The uh, theater achieves a certain credibility, and that's the branding of cinemas, which gives it that uh, credibility. And that also helps the film uh, films on other channels and other media. Some people say, we're going to show it in the cinema because we need uh, subsidies and so on. But basically, the film is not intended for the cinema, for cinema theaters. Now, um, for us, uh, I believe it's the wrong focus to use energy uh, to defend uh, time slots. That's a waste of energy. If we uh, defend the uh, time windows as a, uh, an industry, this is going to ch change things, and this is a much greater threat. Then you have to look at um, how the investments are spent. Because often uh, the smaller budgets will go to uh, theaters. And uh, I think that uh, that is a bigger threat as far as theaters are concerned. Are there any questions? Um, there are many small and younger distributors taking up small films, 2,000 to 12,000 spectators, the group screenings, which pay for each person in the group are essential for achieving success. Maybe it could be interesting to how this could be combined within a distribution strategy for smaller films. Do you want to answer? Have you understood the question? Yes, so, sorry, I was also listening to the interpretation, so I was on mute. Um, yeah, we do a lot of that, you know, even on virtual and in, in the kind of previous world and now in this hybrid space as well, where we do do group screening. So and online we have been doing either with groups where they get a discount or where the whoever the organizer pays a screening fee and then all of the participants or the viewers get a um, get a viewing code or a viewing link. So there is a way of creating group activity. We do watch parties, which are slightly different. You can do film film groups, um, maybe organizations that sponsor a screening as they would have held before. So there's a lot of flexibility with the technology as well on how we can do group bookings. But again, you know, unless we can report those uh, numbers, they're really just internal to us uh, at the moment. But yes, we do focus a lot on group group bookings, but that's where the events come from. So we do the online events that hopefully trigger a lot of extra um, transactions to view the film, even if the events for the moment and for the most part are, are free and not geo-blocked, um, whereas the films are geo-blocked and, and transactional. Maybe to, to the last question to wrap up um, the podium, um, you, what do you think, what will these, um, um, developments mean for the public, for the viewers of 
documentaries? I think they enjoy the freedom of choice and being able to watch it when they want to, how they want to, but also still, if it's a theatrical documentary, that it still feels like a cinema, a piece of cinema that they're, they're watching. So I, and I do think that cinema going, especially for documentary, will be more event cinema driven, which is a, a space we've worked in for a few years as well, which is trying to get more cinemas playing a film for one night or for a limited run um, and focus on something extra around the film rather than just play it and see what happens. I think that that's a not a good use of cinema space, I think, in the future. Misha, wie siehst du das für das Publikum? Misha, how do you see uh, future developments for the audience? That's a, it's hard to say. I've just been listening carefully to what uh, Eve was telling us last week in the NZZ Sonntag. Uh, uh, someone wrote that uh, distributors um, don't uh, are not willing to experiment. Uh, and uh, I thought that was rather arrogant to uh, maintain that. Maybe we are not in the same uh, situation as you are with modern uh, cinema. Maybe we have some way to go. But um, specifically in this pandemic situation, the distributors uh, have tried things out with the theater operators. The um, new platform has been tested, for example. And this is an open source project. They want to make it available to everyone. I think uh, it's fantastic that they have uh, uh, set this up. There are other projects outside the box is uh, working on it. And my film is also a project which is uh, taking on a certain degree of importance. And I hope that in the next few months we will be able to try things out because we don't know how the audience is going to react after COVID-19 is over. Maybe people will have got into the habit of uh, watching films uh, on the internet from home, or maybe people are dying to get back to the cinema theaters. Uh, we, we don't know yet, but um, we, we have the potential to do much better and we have to react with various different hybrid production forms. For example, we have a uh, film, a nemesis of Thomas Silbach, was uh, uh, postponed three times uh, from January to May now. And we have now decided that we would show this film hybrid, but not just, not only virtually. We want to adopt a hybrid approach on the big screen and, for example, to make this film available to the audience uh, via something like my film. So that's maybe the way uh, one should see things uh, today as a distributor, in other words, to uh, uh, offer hybrid, of, uh, hy hybrid possibilities. What do you think the uh, uh, opportunities are for the audience in the future, Tobias? Well, I think we have to, Tobias, uh, first, I think we have to look at people's needs. I believe that there is a kind of uh, original human need for people to experience things as, as a group, uh, as a collective group. Now, if a documentary film has worked well in the cinema, in the cinema theater, does not necessarily work well online, even though theoretically online you can reach a larger audience. And I believe this is uh, greatly to do with the fact that in a cinema, one watches a film uh, together collectively and uh, has, has uh, had an experience uh, together. And as I've said, um, people are, we're trying to solve this. People are trying to solve the problem with these watch parties. These watch parties, I believe it's exciting to do that and it's right to do that. But um, I believe this is a very important aspect for theaters. Um, I, I don't think we should just uh, give things away permissively. However, we have to really accompany the uh, screenings. And I think the collective experiences is very important. 
and uh, the experience is very different from just uh, uh, watching uh, a particular film on Netflix at a certain time uh, tomorrow. And um, it's true that um, people, if, if, if people have seen Breaking Bad an evening on uh, Netflix, they maybe talk about it the next day uh, in, in the office. But um, nevertheless, I think documentary programs need um, uh, accompanying programs and uh, in order to get the best effect. Thank you so would like to thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Eve. Thank you, Tobias Faust. Thank you, Misha Shivov, for your participation. I would like to thank all the viewers here on site and also online. I would like to thank you all very much indeed for your creative documentaries. And uh, I hope that we will be able to uh, carry our films uh, to a global audience, whether it's uh, via cinema theatres or via online screenings. Thank you for attending.